Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Gone Fishing. I'm your host, Connor, CEO at Finn, and I'm joined once again by the amazing Adam Walter, founder and president of Humanize IT. Adam, how are you? Doing well. Doing well. Good to I'm, hear. I'm, I'm through my, my second cup of coffee here, so I'm getting a little bit more energetic. The third cup of coffee jitters haven't started yet. The second cup of coffee clarity has, so we've caught you right into the sweet spot. Adam. We're not in the fourth cup of coffee rage yet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or just uh, heart palpitations is another way to say that. Yeah. Um, for folks, if you haven't looked at the previous episodes, we talked about uh, humanizing security. We talked about security through laziness. Essentially, security exists to secure convenience, uh, not the other way around. So we should really think about anything that introduces convenient inconvenience into the process. And now we're talking about the end users themselves. First question I would love to ask you is what do you define as an end user? Uh, an end user is anybody who can access your system. So anybody. That, that includes the folks on the security team. Yes. Um, the e Even clients that walk in the door. So let's say they don't even have a, an account in your environment, but they actually access your environment physically. Okay. Sitting down at a meeting, that is an end user. So if you've got a vendor who comes into a conference room and sits down in that vendor room there for that time in your building, they are an end user you have to deal with. How is their experience in the building? Do they just get to walk in and go wherever they want? Do they get to be escorted? What is the process for them? So an end user can be anybody from the engineer who's securing systems all the way over to the person just walking in to dust your countertops i guess it depends on what activities they're actually performing because in some scenarios your security folks would be end users in other scenarios they would be implementing tools for end users but not one themselves they're still an end user they're just doing a different function just the admin side of the end user it is are your accounting um folks uh, employees um no not at this point <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you look about a, co a corporate environment, are they employees? Yes. They're signing paychecks. They're managing funds. They're processing everything. But that's the core part of your business is is managing the cash flow of your business is something that an owner does. So are, that'd be like a security person. Oh, I'm not an end user. I'm a security person. No, nope. you're still a you're still employed by this company. You have a different set of functions. I think that's why a lot of engineers get really uppity about being restricted. Like, yeah. well, I've been in environments where the engineers do not have access to certain files and folders. They, they you don't get admin access to everything. We, we've restricted you from certain things. That's a and that's OK, but they about. get really uppity about it. No, I get admin access. Well, what about the business owner? No, they don't get access. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I've heard that before, too. And so that's why I treat everybody as an end user. You don't get to go in and change payroll information. Sorry. <laughs> you don't get to go in and manage RPR. Sorry that you are restricted there. Somebody else's job. And just same thing with the security. You, you know, security has checks and balances. You don't get to manage all security. If somebody gets your account, then how do we how do we recover? That's why we have offsite backups. You don't get access to that security team. Engineers, you don't get access to that. You know who gets those? My janitors. My facilities operators, my CFO, somebody other than an engineer gets those because I have to protect the organization against all end users, including our security officers. There was a hack recently that there was published um, where they lost all their backups because they didn't have any out of band backups. I mean, I know it's a best practice, but you, you forget that if your engineer has access to all the backups. That means that's an account that has access to all your backups. So, yes, security people are end users. They have to go through the same training, the same protocols and treated the same as anybody else. They're still human. The call does come from inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Watch Scream with my kids uh, last year. I introduced them to that whole series. It's an interesting. Isn't that what that's from? Uh, Scream? Uh, yeah. And then there's there's a whole bunch of other scary movies where there's like a similar thing, but it was popularized with Scream. Yeah. So. so. So we talk about like engaging the end user. And if you see yourself as 
I think you, um, maybe this is what you're driving at there is if you see yourself as better, yeah. as uh, more elite, you, you no longer are able to get on the same wavelength as them. Now you're other, you're management, yeah. you're, you know, the person they're working against. They're going to hide things from you. They're going to um, not relate to you because you're not in the same pool as them. But if it's a security person, you're like, oh, yeah. That annoys me, too. Here's what I do to make it easier. It's uh, an interesting conversation that nobody would expect you to have as a security professional. Um, and it's actually really interesting. Like if you're if you're for folks who are actually listening or watching watching right now, how quickly do conversations end when you feel that the person on the other side of the conversation with every fiber of your being believes they're better than you? Yeah, oh, I don't want to talk to this person anymore. Um, and I, I made a LinkedIn post a while ago, but I have a lot of conversations with, with security professionals about this, where it's like, if you could boil down what you would change about security in one word, it's like you get one word to change all the security. What is it? It's like empathy. It's like, there's so little of it. And, um, I remember when I would go talk to what I considered end users, which were employees at uh, the clients of our MSPs, like the people I call them on the front lines, doing the work, like they're the people we impact the most. It's like I would ask him, it's like, what do you hate? What do you not hate? Like, tell me about your experience with your security team so far. Half of them are on site. Half of them are off site. What are you talking about? And almost every single one at some point during that conversation, but it usually doesn't take very long, says, oh, and they think they're smarter than me. And that's why I can't do all these. So they think I'm just some dumb person that can't function. It's like, yeah, uh, yeah. well, you have a job doing a complex tat, like accounting at a company. You're not dumb. Yeah. You're responsible for different activities i think i we we had a we had a podcast a while ago about talking about cfos and you know you you get into these meetings with the cfo and you're engaging them on like okay here's what we need to do here are the risks and the behaviors of the environment and here's what we need to spend and you end up talking down to the cfo like as if they're some kind of bumbling fool maybe you've got a cfo who's like they're older um they're not as tech savvy uh, but Ian, you're like, well, I don't even know how they're in the shop. Like, I guarantee you, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, when you're sitting down with the CFO, you're probably wrong. I'll go ahead and play a chess match against that person. Well, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> and the, the concept is like, if you don't see them as an equal and you don't treat them as an equal, you're just going to come across as just arrogant. Like, oh, this young whippersnapper telling me what to do. They don't understand risk. Why should I listen to you if you don't listen to me? The CFO is so much more complex than managing receipts. But that's all we see them as. Oh, they just deal with spreadsheets and receipts. Like, no, they like I I'm a, I, I consider myself a fairly educated uh, human being that has done really well in engineering. And I barely have a grasp on how finance works in a company. It's so freaking hard. <laughs> and every time I think I understand it, um, and I've been through MBA level accounting, right? So every time I think I've got a grasp on it, there's always more. Like, I can explain to you how regression analysis works. I can explain to you the math, but there's so much going on on strategy and forecasting and dealing with employee hires and predicting economic outcomes that this CFO, there's a reason why they're not good at technology. because They're too busy dealing with people. Same thing with the CEO. They're dealing with people. This is a gold mine in front of you. And if you were empathetic and spent your time listening more than you spent your time trying to convince them that you're right, you're going to be able to connect more dots like, oh, this is what you're really worried about. Well, in that case, let's do it this way. Let's focus on this. So as a CFO, maybe their biggest concern is every time I get on a plane, my controller gets an email saying, please, train, please wire $10,000. How do they know? Like, well, we can't stop it. But what we can do is this. And you can make it easier for them. And we can mitigate that concern for you. Because the, the actors out there are very smart. And they know that your controller is going to be confused while you're on that plane. They can't get a hold of you. I'm like, oh, Bob needs this transferred. This is normal. He's going to that conference. It makes sense. And, um, you know, maybe that's Bob's big concern. But you're too busy selling them on firewall and endpoint security 
And his biggest concern is these phishing emails that come in every time he gets on a plane. He's just tired of it. It is interesting how people know every time we get a new employee, somebody ends up emailing them or texting them saying, hey, this is Connor. Uh, You know, can you help me? So actually, (laughs) I give everyone my phone number now. It's like, this is me. I'm not going to text you, but save this number in your phone so that when I I text you and it's not this number, you know it's not me. Yeah. Uh, It's the quickest way to get rid of that. Um, I've always found that people who are genuinely smart had the ability to talk in such a way that I understood. It's like they can communicating more. You could be the smartest person in the world. If you can't communicate effectively, it doesn't really mean much. Um, Mm -hmm. And actually, I remember when I I was studying math in college, that was the exact uh, statements that my professors would say is like, who, who does the best in this field? How do these mathematicians become great? And what do they do? And the answer was they, they talk better than everyone else. They make people like them. It's like connections. Yeah. Uh, networking and building those connections again, going back to your empathy comment, that's where you start be seeing really cool things happen. You know, when I, when I was working with my employees, like saying, wow, we're really tired of changing our passwords every 30 days. And I said, well, let me solve that problem for them. Well, okay. What, how long does it take to crack a password if it was 15 characters? You know, what's the current state of the union, right? So, well, okay, if we can get them to 15 character passwords, then the 90 days becomes viable. And so I solved that problem. It's like, look, if you do passphrases instead, and I taught them how to do passphrases, and then they started teaching each other. Then we came up with the security protocol that worked. I could have sat in my office and made people do forms and give me feedback um, that way. But instead, I talked to them and I listened to their frustrations and I found a security solution that helped. And made their lives easier. And so engaging the the end user in a conversation, not doing some kind of form feedback, but actually an actual like fluid conversation where I listen to them complain about their car, their kids, uh, maybe complain about how they don't get paid enough. Uh, by the way, security red flag right there. Anyways, um, all these things so that I can get on board with them. And know how to help them in the end of the day. Because that's all we are in the end. Whether you're a security provider or a exchange admin or whatever you are, you're there to support the business and help it make money. And maybe your particular area of focus is risk management. And you're helping them do that. Have you ever watched the movie Margin Call, by the way? Margin Call? Yeah, it's a great movie about the financial crisis in 2008. Uh-uh. I worked uh, for a bank marketing firm during that time. That was a good time. There was um, there's a scene that I think perfectly captures this where this ex rocket scientist who now becomes uh, like an analyst at this trading firm. Finds a bunch of uh, huge red flag, like huge issues that end up bringing in the 2008 financial crisis. So they fly in the CEO of this multi-billion dollar bank. And the guy's talking to him and the multi-billion dollar CEO, he's like, stop. He's like, pretend I'm five and you've met me for the first time. Tell me what's wrong. He goes, it wasn't my brains that got me here. I could obviously the, the person has to have some some mild level of intelligence. But he's like, nah, you're a rocket scientist. I'm not going to understand this. Explain it to me like I'm in kindergarten and you just met me. Yeah. <laughs> the guy was like, this is the risk we can tolerate. This is a big problem. And he's like, you're telling me that we're all, like, we're going to get to that level of risk. He's like, no, we got here three weeks ago. And he's like, I understand now. Thank you. It like, took like 20 seconds uh, to understand. And I, I thought that was hilarious. I think uh, when I was easier, my MBA program or one of my communications classes, they talked about when you write to your general public, like people who are working in your organization, assume a fifth grader. Assume a fifth grade reading comprehension. Yeah. And if you do that, you'll communicate much more effectively. Don't assume that everybody has a collegiate uh, understanding of syntax and grammar. You're going to lose people. Uh, You're read like a, a policy document and they're written with these big flowery words. I'm like, I've got a pretty extensive vocabulary. I read like a good three to six books a month. And I'm I'm starting to gloss over here. 
Like I've actually I actually read the EULAs before I before I agree. I'm one of those people. <laughs> uh, Larian has one of the best ones. If you read, if you play Baldur's Gate, right in the middle, like subsection five, they talk about like no deals with eldritch gods. <laughs> That's funny. It just like I'm the person who's going to catch that, and I appreciate it because I get through there, and all of a sudden it's it's funny and it's entertaining. But if we talk about like how we we talk over the people in the end, and they they have their own pride, they don't want to admit usually that you're talking over them. They just will nod along and be okay. Like, oh, we had a great meeting. Yeah, well, did they engage you at all? Did they give you feedback in the meeting? If they're not talking with you or as much as you are, then you're losing them. Right. You're preaching. And so a great CEO, like what you said, will say, talk to me like I'm five. They'll, they'll take the pride out of the equation. It's like, I need to understand. Most people won't do that. Like, they like, I should get that, but I don't. It's like when I first graduated college, I did not know what Wi-Fi was. It, it was 2002, guys. Um, I, <laughs> I'm sitting there like everybody's talking about this Wi-Fi thing. I'm like, what are you talking about? And, you know, Google is, is still there. So I go over Google and like Wi-Fi and they're talking about wireless protocols. And so I'm like, what the heck? And finally, I figured out they were talking about AO211.B. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Well, why don't you just say AO211? Because most people don't care about the protocols. They don't want to know the RFCs. They want to know Wi-Fi. The thing that I, I open up my computer and I'm online. It's wireless. Cool. Me as an engineer, I'm going to talk about AO211.B versus G, how this protocol works, 5.4 gigahertz versus 2.4 gigahertz. And at that point, I've lost the person in the room with me. But if I just say the real fast Wi-Fi. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody's on board with me. That's what I did with my parents. Uh, they're like, why does, you know, why is five better upstairs than 2.4? I was like, all right, do you know what a hertz is? Like, hertz is a frequency. It's like this, the speed at which the wave is coming at you is like, and then it also represents energy. So it's like, picture that the wave length of a five gigahertz uh, signal is this long. Which roughly means it's like it can pass through this much material without getting largely, you know, blocked. Two point four gigahertz is, or no, it's the other way around. Five gigahertz way around. is way more energy. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to correct you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thank you. You could have. Uh, I'll, two, I'll let the podcast listeners judge you. you. <laughs> two two point four. I was wondering. I was like, wait, this doesn't sound too right. Two point four has uh, less energy. Five has way more, so it's a shorter wavelength, yep. so it can come in with a higher frequency. Um, it's like, so that is a tendency to get scattered by materials that are longer than, I don't even know the actual math on like, what's the actual depth of material it can traverse, but that was it. It was like longer wavelengths can get through more material. That's why five gigahertz is way better in that corner of your home or yep. 2.4 gigahertz did it yep. again. And they're like, all right, I don't care, but thank you. I'm like, <laughs> so I renamed it fast and slow home. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like, that's it. I was like, all right, you don't need to know this anymore. You know, it just kind of help wrap up is that when you're talking to your end user, a great litmus test to know, are you talking on their level? Are they responding back? Are they asking questions? Are you asking questions of them and getting good answers? So if I spent an entire conversation with my parents talking about two point, my parents are fairly intelligent people. Like they, they're educated. They've got degrees in science. And I can say, well, uh, 2.4 gigahertz. And here's how the protocol works. And at the header of the protocol, here's what's really cool. And then if you get to this one, they actually can help you within. They can actually help you bounce off walls. And, you know, like, no, end's better. It'll get to the corner of your house. That's it. I don't need to explain to them the minute details. I don't need to make them like me. I seem to make them understand so that they know which one to use. And I can say, hey, look, this is how this works. I can explain to you how payloads work on Internet. I can explain to you the OSI seven layer model, but I'm not going to. How does this packet? How does this Internet website work? I can show you or I can just say, Somewhere there's a box over there that's giving you information and you're just asking for it. Think of like your phone book. You're looking up an address and going, I know if I go here, I can buy bananas. <laughs> I can call this phone number and they'll ship me bananas. The money's and in the bananas. It's stand. completely wrong analogy. But for the sake of my end user or my family member, it works. <laughs> yeah. You can't decide what people get curious on. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, for folks who wanted to learn more about you or Humanize IT, where would you suggest they go? I can head to LinkedIn and see our weekly updates that help you run your business better, your MSB and your client relationships. Or you can go to humanizeit.biz and learn more about our product line. Awesome. Folks, we'll have links to Adam and Humanize IT in the show notes. Feel free to connect, ask him questions about uh, 2.4 versus 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi and see see what he gives you. But um, Adam, thanks so much for joining today. It was a blast having you. Hey, thank you, everyone. Anytime. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye. As always, everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to Gone Fishing. If you want to find out more about high-quality security awareness training campaigns, how to launch them in ways that actually engage employees to change their habits, then check us out, FinSecurity, at FinSec.io. That's P-H-I-N-S-E-C.io. Or click all of the wonderful links in our show notes. Thanks for fishing with me today, and we'll see you next time.